Why are polar bears white? The polar bear lives in the Arctic, the region of the North Pole. Most of its environment is barren, covered year-round with ice and snow and not much else. A polar bear might eat what few plants it can find. But it feeds mostly on water animals like seals and small walruses, which share its frozen home. The polar bear's yellowish-white coat helps it blend into its snowy surroundings as it hunts its prey. After all, there is not much in the Arctic to hide behind. The fur of a polar bear is also extremely thick. Allowing it to withstand polar temperatures and swim in Arctic waters, where its prey is often found. Polar bears are excellent swimmers. And their unique paws with hairy soles allow them to run very quickly over ice and snow without slipping. Do people use more muscles when they smile, or when they frown? Yes, what your parents tell you is true, it takes far more muscles to frown than it does to smile. Smiling only uses 17 muscles, while frowning requires 43. What makes a shadow? Visible light spreads out in waves as it leaves its source. These waves travel in straight lines through the air until they hit an object. The object will absorb some of the waves and reflect some back into the air. Light waves will not be able pass through most materials, unless they are clear, like glass. Behind any object that has stopped the light waves is a dark spot. Or shadow, which is simply a space where no light is. There are no shadows in dark rooms because no light waves are traveling through them. And on overcast days you won't see shadows outside because the sun's rays are absorbed and scattered in. All directions by the clouds in the sky, not enough direct light waves make it to earth to cause shadows. What causes the seasons? Earth's complete orbit around the Sun takes about 365 days, or one year. During the course of the orbit, Earth tilts on its axis. When the northern end of Earth tilts toward the Sun, it receives more of the Sun's direct rays. These rays warm the northern hemisphere and its summer season arrives. At the same time, winter comes to the southern hemisphere, which then receives less direct solar rays. As Earth continues its orbit through the year, it tilts on its axis in the other direction. Then the winter season comes to the northern hemisphere, and the southern hemisphere enjoys summer. This tilt of Earth also explains why the length of days varies throughout the year. In the summer, more direct solar rays give us longer days. Why do husbands and wives divorce?
husbands and wives divorce when they can no longer live happily together. It is usually a sad thing. Because when people marry they expect to be with their partner for the rest of their lives. But over the course of a marriage things happen and people change and the happiness that the couple was so sure of in the beginning sometimes disappears. When couples with children get divorced it is even more unfortunate because more people are affected. Many children feel bad when their parents divorce because their family will not be the same. After a divorce, they generally do not see one of their parents as much as they did before. Still, just because the feelings between a mother and a father change, doesn't mean that their love for their children changes in any way. It's important to remember that divorce is something that happens. Between a husband and wife it has nothing to do with the kids. Many children feel that if they adjust their behavior somehow their parents will want to stay together. But divorces are not caused by anything kids do. Why does your shadow change shape during a sunny day? It has to do with the location of the sun and the angle of the light waves that hit you. When the sun is high in the sky, the angle of its light waves in relation to you produce a short, squat shadow. When the sun is low in the sky, early or late in the day, it produces a long, giant-sized shadow. One way to think about this concept is to pretend you could draw a line from the sun that schemes the top of your head and ends on the ground behind you. When the sun is right above you, that line will end very close to your body, and so will your shadow. When the sun is low during evening hours, that line, and your shadow, will end farther behind you. How do you know when to keep a secret and when to tell? A good rule to follow. If a secret makes you feel bad, scared, or confused, share it with an adult you trust. What is a best friend? A best friend is a special pal who generally likes to do a lot of the same things you like. You tend to have more fun with your best friend than with other friends. And you can tell him or her more of your feelings, even secrets, because you trust that person more than anyone else. And your best friend feels the same way about you, sharing important ideas and feelings. It seems like your best friend understands you better than any other person you know. You care about each other a great deal. You share your good times and bad times with a best friend, and that person does the same with you. What is thunder? Thunder is the sound made by the gases in the air around lightning. 
which are quickly heated and expand when a strike occurs. Put simply, thunder is the sound of hot air exploding. Loud thunder may seem frightening, but it is totally harmless. What is a disability? The word disabled usually refers to a person who has a physical or mental handicap that keeps him or her from doing certain tasks or makes performing them unusually difficult. Most physical disabilities, like blindness or paralysis, are easily noticed, but many mental disabilities are harder to detect. Mental disabilities can include diseases like schizophrenia, which causes severe disturbances in people's thoughts and emotions. Another category of disability is learning disabilities, like dyslexia, which is a learning disorder that makes reading very difficult because the brain reverses the order of letters and words. A disability can be the result of a disease, an accident, or of genetics, which means that it is a condition that a person is born with. A lot of times disabled people can learn new ways to do things or use special machines or specially trained animals to help them work around their disability. Many disabled people prefer the term differently abled, a description that doesn't divide people into categories like normal and disabled, but addresses the idea that every person has different abilities. In ancient and medieval times, people were frightened of and cruel to those with disabilities. Because those disabilities were not understood, the disabled were ignored or abused. Even today, many people feel uncomfortable or awkward around disabled people staring at them. Treating them differently, or even behaving unkindly. Classifying disabled people as different makes it easier for some people to behave in a disrespectful way toward them. But it's important to remember that all people, regardless of whether they have the use of their legs or eyes, or whether they learn quickly or slowly, deserve to be treated with decency. What should I do when I meet a stranger? Most of the strangers you encounter are decent people who treat children with respect and would never think of hurting them. But there are dangerous people who do harmful things to children. How do rockets blast off? A rocket has a simple heat engine. It uses quick burning fuels, known as propellants. In a combustion chamber, which has an open end at the bottom. The hot gases produced from the burning fuel expand and push in all directions. But they can escape only at the open end, and they do so with great speed and force. The difference in pressure between the closed front and open back of the chamber pushes the rocket forward. The size of a rocket blastoff depends on the amount of gas it produces and the speed at which it is released. 
Weapons like large missiles and spaceships use rocket engines to power them. The Chinese are believed to have used the first rocket type. Weapons pieces of bamboo filled with gunpowder about 1000 years ago. Most engines require oxygen, supplied by air, to burn the fuels that power them. Rocket engines, however, need to be able to operate in airless outer space. So they can't rely on oxygen normally found in the air. Rocket fuel is usually a mixture that includes oxygen in liquid form. How big were the largest dinosaurs? Information about dinosaurs changes all the time as new bones are found and new evidence about their surroundings becomes available. Each year, scientists discover around seven new types of dinosaurs. The dinosaur now considered the largest could be pushed out of first place by another creature soon to be discovered. The largest dinosaurs belong to the group called sauropods. These giant plant eaters include the Apatosaurus, pronounced Apatosaurus. Used to be called Brontosaurus, and Brachiosaurus, pronounced Brachiosaurus. Which weighed around 80 tons, that's 160,000 pounds or 72,640 kilograms, and stood 50 feet, 15 meters, tall. Among the longest of these dinosaurs were the Seismosaurus, pronounced Syzimosaurus, and Supersaurus. The Seismosaurus may have been as long as 150 feet, 45 meters while the Supersaurus may have stretched to nearly 100 feet, 30 meters. A newly discovered dinosaur, called Paralytodon, is thought to have been close to 100 feet. 30 meters, long, weighing close to 70 tons, 140,000 pounds, or 63,560 kilograms. The upper bone of its forelimb, front leg, is 6 feet, 7 inches long, close to 2 meters. The Argentinosaurus, thought to weigh as much as 100 tons, 200,000 pounds, or 90,800 kilograms, was uncovered in the late 1990s in Argentina, which was home to many of the world's largest dinosaurs. These gentle giants were once thought to live in watery, swampy regions. But recent evidence suggests that most of them were forest dwellers who ate leaves from the tops of trees. They had enormous bodies, very long necks, relatively small heads, and thick, tree trunk like legs, much like an elephant's legs. They moved very slowly and didn't have many ways to defend themselves. But their tremendous size kept most predators away. What causes waves? The wind blowing across water causes most waves. The size of a wave depends on the strength of the wind, how long it blows, and the distance over which it travels. Strong winds and great distances create big waves. 
waves occur when the wind forces the surface of water up as it tries to pull it along. And gravity pulls it back down again. These push and pull forces cause the up and down movement of waves. The tops of waves are known as crests, and their bottoms are called troughs. Although wavy water looks like it's traveling along, it really doesn't move much, other than up and down. The water droplets that make up that wave travel in a kind of circle, propelled by the energy of the wind. With the top of the circle being the crest of the wave. A seagull floating in the water. Will move up and down with the swelling of a wave, but it won't move forward toward the shore. When waves reach a shoreline, though, their action is affected by the shallow ocean floor. And they are said to break on the shore. Their water moves forward with some force, up onto a beach or against rocks. Wave crests that break into white foam are called white caps. Why is some hair curly and other hair straight? Hair grows from tiny holes in the skin called follicles. Follicles can have different shapes and sizes. Hair type is determined by the shape and size of the follicles from which they grow. Large follicles mean you'll have thick hair, while narrow follicles result in fine hair. Straight hair comes from round follicles, wavy hair from those that are oval. And curly hair grows from follicles that look like flattened ovals. What are bugs? Most people use the word bug when talking about insects like beetles, bees, and butterflies. And other small, many-legged creatures that crawl, jump, or fly, such as spiders and centipedes. All of these critters belong to the same phylum, called Arthropoda. Which also includes crustaceans, like lobsters and crabs. Arthropods have hard skeletons on the outside of their bodies. Called exoskeletons, and they also have jointed limbs, arthropod means jointed feet. Arthropods make up more than 80% of the world's animal species. The word bug does correspond with an official category, though, in the scientific world. A true bug is classified as an insect that belongs to the order Hemiptera. The insects in this order can be recognized by the X-shaped pattern on their backs. A design formed by their wings at rest. They also have sucking mouth parts and a hardened gula, which is the underside of the head. The 30,000 species of the Hemipteran order include bed bugs, fire bugs, and some water bugs. How can I get a bigger allowance? One way to get a bigger allowance is to prove to your parents that the amount you are getting now is not enough to cover your expenses. Keep track of your spending for a week by making a list. Show this to your parents when you 
Tell them about the increase you think you should have. Explain why your expenses have changed that the price of movie tickets has gone up at your neighborhood theater, for example. If you want to save money to buy something expensive, tell them that, too. Or maybe you feel that you have grown old enough to handle more of your own expenses. Like buying your own clothes. Whatever your reasons for needing a bigger allowance, present them as clearly and calmly as you can. Give your parents time to think it over and you might have good results. Why do some plants die in winter, while others don't? Plants that grow in temperate zones, where there are changes of seasons. Have to be able to go dormant or rest when conditions like short days and cold temperatures become unfavorable for growth. Many trees and shrubs do this by shedding their leaves in the fall. Halting photosynthesis and reducing moisture loss. A great number of flowering plants, known as herbaceous perennials, die down to ground level, sheltering new buds in the ground until spring arrives. Autumn, with its shorter days and cool nights, begins a survival process in plants called hardening off. Lacking conditions for new growth then, a plant uses its energy to build up more food in its cells. This buildup, in turn, pushes water out into surrounding spaces. Where it will do little damage when it freezes. Plants without this ability to harden their tissues die once freezing temperatures arrive. We call plants that die in winter leaving only their seeds to grow again in spring dash tender plants. Or annuals, because they complete their life cycles within a year. Hardy plants, or perennials, are capable of surviving many winter seasons. Continuing to grow year after year. What is the moon? The planets of our solar system orbit the Sun, held in their paths by the Sun's gravitational force. Other heavenly bodies in our solar system called natural satellites or moons orbit the planets in a similar way. Some planets have many moons, Saturn has 18, but Earth has just one. Our moon is an almost round natural satellite that consists of layers of different rock. Similar in structure to Earth. It is believed that both were created at the same time, when our solar system was formed. Some scientists think that the moon broke off from Earth after our planet collided with another. Unlike Earth, however, the moon has no water or atmosphere, so nothing can live or grow on it. Without an atmosphere, nights, where the moon is turned away from the sun, are fiercely cold, and days, where the moon receives the sun's full rays, are very hot. The moon is located about 240,000 miles, 386,400 kilometers from Earth, close enough for astronauts to make a visit. The moon's diameter is about 2,160 miles, 
3,478 kilometers. Roughly one quarter that of Earth, and Earth has about 80 times more mass or weight. The moon does not shine on its own, the moonlight that we see is simply sunlight reflected off its surface. Why are some animals active only at night? Many animals, including lots of large predators, are diurnal. Meaning they are active during the day and sleep at night. Others are nocturnal sleeping throughout the day in burrows. Dens, caves, or trees emerging at night to find food. Nocturnal animals that are predators use the cover of darkness to hunt their prey without being seen. Those that are prey can also use the darkness to hide. In general, there is less competition for food at night. In desert climates, nights have the added advantage of being cooler. Many animals spend the hottest part of the day sleeping and conserving energy, coming out in the cool night air to hunt for a meal. Nocturnal animals have special adaptations that allow them to function in darkness. Several nighttime creatures, including owls and cats, have eyes that are a certain shape and have a particular kind of cell that helps them see with very little light. Bats, the only flying mammals, are usually nocturnal, and some species get around in the dark by using a kind of sonar called echolocation, the bats make sounds that bounce off nearby objects. And when the sound waves return they carry information about the location and size of those objects. Good hearing and senses of smell also come in handy for nocturnal animals. Some animals leave a scented trail, excreting fluid produced in glands in their bodies. To make it easier for them to find their way back in the dark. What are invertebrates? It may seem that most of the world's animals are vertebrates what's left after mammals. Birds, reptiles, amphibians, and fish. In fact, invertebrates make up more than 90% of the world's living animals. Any animal that lacks a backbone is an invertebrate. They do not have a bony skeleton, but many do possess a hard, shell-like exterior. Invertebrates include insects, worms, crustaceans, like crabs and lobsters. Mollusks, clams and oysters, and arachnids, spiders, scorpions, and ticks. Why do I have to be a good sport when I lose a game? Games or competitions always have winners and losers. When you agree to play a game you have to prepare yourself for the fact that you may not win. Accepting a loss is hard because winning a game gives you a wonderful feeling of being the best. What is an asteroid?
sometimes described as minor planets, asteroids are rocky objects that orbit around the Sun. Most of them are located in a belt between Mars and Jupiter. Scientists believe there may be more than 50,000 asteroids in that belt. And perhaps millions more elsewhere in space. They range in size from nearly 600 miles, 965 kilometers. In diameter to some that are only about 20 feet, 6 meters, across. While 20 feet seems small compared to 600 miles. The smallest asteroids would still have a pretty impressive impact if they hit Earth. Slight changes in asteroids' orbits occasionally cause them to collide with each other. Resulting in small fragments breaking off from the hole. Sometimes these small fragments leave their orbit and fall through Earth's atmosphere as meteors. Called meteorites if they hit the planet's surface. Some scientists have suggested that it was a huge asteroids collision with Earth. 65 million years ago that caused the massive damage that led to the extinction of dinosaurs. What is a cocoon? A cocoon is an envelope-like structure made of silk that is spun by an immature insect or larva. It is a protective covering in which the larva passes through. It's an active pupa stage before it becomes an adult insect. These cocoons are often attached to branches or twigs. Caterpillars are the larvae that eventually change, or metamorphose, into butterflies and moths. Only a few types of butterfly caterpillars spin cocoons. A butterfly's cocoon is called a chrysalis, while the caterpillars of many moths do. The cocoon of the silkworm, caterpillar of the silk moth, is collected and processed and woven into the beautiful cloth we know as silk. What is the IQ? Q stands for intelligence quotient. And it is supposed to be a measurement of how naturally intelligent a person is. Intelligence tests are not designed to show how much a person has learned. Rather, they are meant to measure a person's ability to learn. This ability is something that doesn't change much as a person grows older. Even though he or she may pick up a lot of new facts and skills. Scientists think that each person is born with a certain amount of intelligence or mental ability. Still, how well a person uses his or her natural intelligence has a lot to do with. The person's desire to learn and the learning environment in which he or she. Grows up. IQ tests measure things like the ability to use words. The ability to see how things relate to one another, and the ability to store and use information. But a lot of intelligence experts think that IQ tests are unfair. Because they can't help but test a person's learned knowledge in the phrasing of the questions. Depending on where you grew up or what language is spoken in your home. 
you may not be familiar with certain words used in some questions. And if you have trouble understanding what's being asked of you, it can be difficult to demonstrate your ability to think and reason. The term intelligence quotient comes from a mathematical equation used to score intelligence tests. A person's mental age which is determined by how many questions he or she answered correctly on such a test is divided by his or her actual age. Then that number is multiplied by 100 to give an IQ score. A person whose mental and actual age are the same will have an IQ that is 100, which is average. Remember that intelligence is just one thing that contributes to a person's ability to succeed in life and be happy. Special talents, hard work, creativity, and character are just as important. What are chimneys for? Since ancient times people have built fires to stay warm. When fires were built in small dwellings, an opening was needed through which smoke and other byproducts of burning like the dangerous gas carbon monoxide could escape. In places where house were made of combustible, or easily burned, materials like wood and thatch. Dried grasses, fires had to be built outside to protect such dwellings from going up in flames. But even under those circumstances, people eventually figured out a way to make indoor fires safely. They built stone hearths in the middle of their houses. Well away from walls, and made holes in their roofs so that smoke could escape. These hearths came to be located in more convenient places once people learned how to build stone. Fireplaces topped with stone chimneys that channeled smoke safely out of dwellings, high above their roofs. Stone fireplaces could be safely built into the walls of any type of shelter. While our houses are now usually kept warm by central heating systems. We still build fires in fireplaces for temporary warmth and for their beauty and the cozy feeling they give. Stone or brick hearths and chimneys are still needed to protect house walls and roofs from fire. Even houses without fireplaces have chimneys because most furnaces make heat by burning fuel. The poisonous byproducts of this combustion usually flow out of a house by way of a chimney. Keeping the air indoors healthy and safe to breathe. Why is the bald eagle the official national symbol of the United States? In 1782, six years after the end of the Revolutionary War, leaders of the newly independent United States were designing a national seal, an image that would appear on official documents and elsewhere. Eventually these men settled on the bald eagle for the Great Seal of the United States. The bald eagle was chosen in part because it was believed to be found only in North America. The bald eagle was also admired for its strength, its noble appearance, and the freedom of its life spent soaring through the sky. While the eagle became an important American symbol when it was adopted for the U.S. seal in 1782, 
it wasn't until 1787 that it officially became the national emblem. The bald eagle has been used for the official seals of many states. And it has appeared on stamps, currency, or paper money, and several coins, including the quarter. The bald eagle's head is covered with white feathers. Why are leopards spotted? Like the fur of many animals, the leopard's coat is a form of camouflage. Camouflage helps animals blend in with their environments. Making them less visible to predators, the animals that hunt them, and prey, the creatures they hunt. Mostly found in the forests of Africa and Asia, leopards, which hunt in trees and on the ground. Blend in with the dappled sunlight shining through leafy tree branches and other plant life. Melanin is the organic chemical responsible for the pigmentation or color of animal. And human, skin, the more pigmentation, the darker the color. Black panthers are really leopards that have melanism, a condition of excess pigmentation. If you look closely at a black panther, careful. You may be able to see the same spots that a normal leopard has against a very dark background. Because leopards are mostly nocturnal resting during the day and active. At night this dark coloration causes little problem for black panthers. Can some animals grow a new limb after one has been cut off? There are many creatures that have the ability to replace body parts that have been lost. In fact, this process, called regeneration, happens in all living things at some level. Life is not possible without regeneration. Generally, the more complex the organism, the less dramatic the regeneration. Human beings can replace old skin cells with new ones, for example. While a certain species of flatworm can regenerate a new head and tail basically a whole new worm from any one of its segments. A hydra, a freshwater invertebrate with a tube-like body that has several tentacles at one end. Has such amazing regenerative ability that an entirely new hydra can be regrown from just a tiny fragment of the animal. Several insects, if they lose a limb before they reach their adult stage, can grow a new one. Crustaceans like crabs and lobsters can replace lost claws or legs with new ones. Even some vertebrates, which are more highly developed than invertebrates, are capable of some amazing regeneration. Bony fish, a group that includes salmon, tuna, and most other creatures we think of as fish, can regrow a fin though the group of fish that includes sharks cannot. Some amphibians can replace lost limbs with new ones. While some lizards can grow a new tail if the old one gets cut off. Birds cannot grow new limbs, though their ability to replace old. Feathers and sometimes beaks with new ones is a type of regeneration. The regeneration that mammals are capable of is more modest deer produce new antlers every year. 
for example, but no mammal can regrow a new limb or tail. What could it be, then? When you talk, you breathe out carbon dioxide and water vapor, two things that plants need to grow. And sound waves from your voice cause plant cells to vibrate. Experiments have shown that certain types and strengths of sound can cause plants to grow better or worse than usual. Plants exposed to classical music for instance, grew thick, healthy leaves and developed good roots. Jazz had the same beneficial effect. Plants exposed to country music had normal growth. But those that were exposed to rock music did very poorly. Their root development was so terrible that the plants began to die. Why do houses usually have lawns around them? Houses have lawns around them for several reasons. The stretches of green grass look pretty, and they are good. Safe places for children to play when they are outside. Also, lawns frequently mark the boundaries that separate one person's property from another. Long ago, only the rich could afford to have lawns. Other people had to use all of their land to raise crops so that they had enough to eat. So a lawn became a status symbol, a sign to others that its owner had enough wealth to waste a portion of his or her land on grass which was merely pretty, not producing anything that could be eaten or sold. That way of thinking may still be at work today, the average American lawn could produce about two. Zero 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 dollars worth of fruits and vegetables if it were planted. But instead of using land as a way to save money, American homeowners do exactly the opposite. Spending several hundred dollars and countless hours each year on maintaining their lawns. Many people value the beauty of a well cared for lawn, however. Admiring the effect of a homeowner's hard work. Dr. John Falk, who works for the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C has conducted studies to prove his own interesting theory about why people like lawns. He thinks that because most of our history as humans was spent on the grassy savannas. Large grassy areas with few trees, of East Africa, our desire to live around lawns is biological. Or passed on through our genes from our prehistoric beginnings. Falk thinks that people naturally prefer the familiarity and safety. Because the approach of predators can be seen, a flat, grassy land over any other kind of environment. And his experiments seem to prove the theory true, Falk showed people from all over the world. Pictures of different terrains desert, rainforest, coniferous, evergreen, forest, deciduous, leaf shedding, forest, and savanna and most chose the grassland as the place where they would like to live. What is puberty?
Puberty is a time of tremendous change physical and emotional that everyone experiences on his or her way to becoming an adult. After the many changes of puberty, people are physically able to reproduce, or have children. Though it takes many more years to develop the emotional maturity required for such a decision. While there are many common elements, every person experiences puberty a little bit differently. And kids go through the changes of puberty at all different paces. Some develop early. Others late. Girls experience different changes than boys. Puberty can be exciting, but it can also be confusing, scary, and lonely. The changes associated with puberty are triggered by the release of certain hormones. Primarily estrogen for girls and testosterone for boys, that signal the body to grow and change. Puberty usually starts between the ages of 8 and 13 for girls and between 10 and 15 for boys. Though it's normal for some kids to develop later. During puberty kids' bodies will not only grow taller, they will also change their basic shapes. Hair that was formerly soft and downy in places like the armpits. Genital area, and, for boys, the face begins to grow in thicker and darker. During puberty, girls develop breasts, their waists get narrower, and their hips broaden. Some girls are alarmed to notice that they gain weight. Or fill out during puberty, but this change is normal and healthy. It's not a good idea to try to counteract the normal growth of puberty with dieting. The female hormones released at puberty eventually trigger menstruation. During each menstrual cycle, which is usually about a month long, an egg is released from one of two ovaries in a girl or woman's body. If the egg were fertilized by sperm, it would implant in the uterus or womb, and eventually grow into a baby. The uterus prepares for pregnancy each cycle by creating a lining of extra tissue and blood that would nourish a growing fetus. If the egg is unfertilized, that lining is expelled through the vagina. A missed period could be a normal occurrence. Many women have irregular cycles, or it may be a sign of pregnancy. Boys' bodies change in different ways during puberty, they get broader shoulders. More developed muscles, and larger penises and testes. Their faces change to look more adult, and their voices deepen as well. Kids going through puberty often notice emotional changes that accompany the physical transformation. Part of the emotional roller coaster of puberty comes from the hormones coursing through your body. And part of it is just confusion and fear about changing from a kid to an adult. It's important to remember, though, that everyone goes through it. And often it can really help to talk about these feelings with a friend or a trusted adult. Why are there deserts? A desert is a land area that receives less than 10 inches of precipitation, rain or snow, a year.
as strange as it seems, that definition makes parts of Earth's polar regions the Arctic and Antarctica desert-like in their climates. The fierce cold there causes dry air, which allows for little precipitation. Most of Earth's deserts, however, are dry, rocky, and sandy. And because the greatest of them border the tropics. North Africa Sahara is the biggest, many of them are hot. Wind patterns are most responsible for the creation of deserts. Most of the world's deserts are located in areas that get a lot of warm, dry wind. That dry air blows through desert regions. Robbing them of moisture and reducing the likelihood of cloud formation and rainfall. High temperatures, which cause evaporation. And surrounding mountains which can stop moist air from approaching can also help CRE8 a desert climate. Why do I poop? The food that you eat which provides the energy that your body needs to keep running and the materials needed for growth and repairs goes through an amazing process once you put it into your mouth. First you chew it into smaller pieces with your teeth. These small pieces are softened by a watery liquid made by your mouths. Salivary glands and molded by your tongue into a soggy ball for swallowing. The chewed up food then begins a journey through a series of connecting tubes. Mushy food travels down your throat and esophagus into your stomach. Powerful muscles in the stomach wall crush it even further and along with strong digestive chemicals made there turn it into a thick soup. Then it goes to your small intestines, where its nutrients pass through thin walls into your bloodstream and are delivered to cells throughout your body. Following that, the leftovers of your food what your body can't use or digest travel to your large intestines. Along with other waste products of the digestive process. Their moisture is removed and returned to your body, and what remains of your food becomes solid waste. This waste is stored in a large tube called the rectum. When the rectum gets full of solid waste, or feces, you get rid of it with a bowel movement through a small opening in your bottom called the anus. Your food makes the entire journey through your digestive system in about 24 hours. Though it could pass through faster or slower than that, depending on the kind of food you've eaten. While you may think that the indigestible part of your food what becomes poop is useless. It is actually very necessary. The unused portion of food called fiber, makes the entire digestive system run smoothly. It gives the special muscles of the digestive tract which move food. Along in traveling waves known as peristalsis something to grip onto. Why are the oceans blue? Like the blue appearance of the sky, oceans, and other bodies of water only appear blue. As you know if you've ever scooped some of that water into a clear container and seen that it isn't actually blue. 
scientists believe some bodies of water appear to be blue. Because of the same principle that makes the sky look blue. When sunlight, which is white light consisting of many wavelengths that each correspond to a different color, hit sea water, some of its wavelengths are absorbed. Others especially the wavelengths that give us the color blue are scattered after colliding with water molecules and reflected back to us. So if water is clear, without too much dirt, algae, or other material floating in it. And at least 10 feet deep, it will appear blue to us. Water that has a lot of dirt or other floating particles can appear brown, green, or gray. How does a light bulb work? Electricity runs through a thin, coiled wire, or filament, in a light bulb. The filament is made of a metal called tungsten, which can reach very high temperatures before it melts. This high melting temperature is a good thing, because when electricity runs through the filament of a light bulb, it reaches a temperature of about 4,500 degrees Fahrenheit, 2,482 degrees Celsius. As the filament becomes white hot, it glows, or becomes incandescent. That glow is the light of an electric bulb. Wires that carry electricity usually allow it to flow through easily. But when wire is very thin like in the filament of a light bulb electrical currents have to force their way through. Causing friction, which causes heat, which, in this case, results in incandescence. Instead of air, light bulbs are filled with a gas called argon. Air has oxygen in it, which all things need to burn. If the super hot filament of a light bulb were exposed to air, it would burn out instantly, instead of giving hundreds of hours of light. How do elevators work? An elevator is any device that moves things or people from one level to another. They are especially important in tall structures like skyscrapers. Where climbing stairs to get to top floors would be very difficult. The car of an elevator, in which people ride, is attached to guard rails inside a tall, empty space called a shaft. It is moved by a steel cable that is attached to a large weight that counterbalances it. An electric motor raises and lowers the cable, changing the positions of the car and weight as the elevator moves from floor to floor. Usually posted inside an elevator are numbers that indicate the car's weight limit. An elevator motor cannot do its job if a car is a lot heavier than the weight that balances it. The first elevators in use were not especially safe because once in a while a cable would break. And a car, pulled by gravity, would come crashing down. Safety devices were soon added, though, to keep such disasters from occurring. American inventor Alicia Otis invented the first safety elevator in 1853. 
Additional ropes attached to cars and powerful metal jaws that grip guard rails keep elevators from falling if their main cables break. Other safety devices keep elevators from moving when their doors are still open and from traveling. Too fast. Automatic switches in the shaft allow an elevator to hurry past unwanted floors. Or to slow and stop when a chosen floor is reached, unlocking its doors to admit and release passengers. Why was the Statue of Liberty built? The Statue of Liberty, officially named Liberty Enlightening the World and sometimes referred to as Lady Liberty, was built in the late 1800s as a symbol of the friendship between France and the United States. France had supported American efforts to gain independence from England in the 1770s. And the United States had returned the favor during France's revolution of the 1780s and 1790s. A joint effort between the two nations, the statue was designed and built in France. While the 154 foot, 47 meter, concrete pedestal was the responsibility of the Americans. Intended as a gift to celebrate the 100-year anniversary, or centennial, of American independence, which happened in 1776, the statue was designed by sculptor Frederick Augusta Bartholdi. He had help from many engineers and designers, including Alexander Gustave Eiffel, the man who designed the Eiffel Tower in Paris, France. Lack of funds in both countries slowed down the construction of the statue. And it wasn't actually completed until 1884, eight years after the centennial. It took nearly a year for the statue, which was broken down and divided among more than 200 crates. To travel across the Atlantic Ocean to the United States. And it was another whole year before the pedestal was completed. Finally, on October 28, 1886, the Statue of Liberty was officially dedicated in front of a crowd of thousands. Made of copper and steel, the statue, which depicts a woman who represents the concept of liberty. Stands just over 151 feet, 46 meters, tall, plus the height of the pedestal. To give an idea of just how big the statue is, bear in mind these statistics, her index finger is 8 feet. 2.4 meters, long. Her nose is 4.5 feet, 1.4 meters, long, and the width of her mouth is 3 feet. 0.9 meters. Lady Liberty holds a torch in one hand, symbolizing enlightenment or freedom from ignorance. The other hand holds a plaque that bears the date of American independence, July 4, 1776. How does the Internet work? Just as telephones are connected by a worldwide phone system. Home and work computers can connect with a global computer communications network known as the Internet. Each computer that is linked to the system has its own Internet address, as individual as a phone number. Home computer users buy the services of an internet provider. 
which is an organization with powerful computers that link all its subscribers to the Internet. Many large organizations and companies have computers that link them directly to the network. Internet users can visit the World Wide Web, which is a global network of websites providing information, entertainment, products, and other services. People can use the Internet to send electronic mail, known as email, to one another in just a few seconds. Once you type a message into your computer to send to your cousin. Let's say who lives miles from you across the country it travels through the wires of your phone line as a series of electrical signals. Or, for some people, the signals travel through the same cables that bring them cable television. These signals travel to a station run by your service provider where a big computer sends them to an internet routing center. Located all over the world, routing centers link to organizations and internet providers send a countless computer communications that come to them each second along the quickest possible routes to their destinations. A giant computer there reads the address on your email and sends it farther. Depending on the distance it must travel, it may continue along phone lines, be changed into light signals that can travel with great speed along thin glass strands called fiber optic cables or be converted into equally speedy invisible bands of energy known as radio waves and transmitted to a communications satellite. That will bounce it back to Earth to a ground station located close to where your cousin lives. Once your message reaches the routing center nearest your cousin, it will be sent to the station of his or her service provider. From there it will be sent along regular phone lines to his or her computer. And all of this happens in a matter of moments. What causes diarrhea? Diarrhea is simply food that moves through your digestive system too fast. It often occurs when the digestive tract is irritated and inflamed by certain foods. Or by an infection caused by germs, bacteria and viruses. In an effort to rid your body of these irritants or germs quickly. The special muscles of your intestines move food along faster than usual, cutting short the digestive process. Your small intestines may not be able to absorb all the nutrients in your food, then. And that part of food that can't be used solid waste isn't able to stay in your large intestines long enough to have its excess moisture removed and returned to your body. That is, why diarrhea is so watery. Because that extra moisture stays in your waist instead of returning to your body. It is important to drink a lot of fluids when you have diarrhea. In addition, it is best to avoid eating solid food for a while. Which will help quiet the hyperactivity of the digestive system. Why are hurricanes given names? Tropical storms, including hurricanes, that have wind speeds of at least 39 miles. 63 kilometers, 
per hour are given human names to identify them. This way, meteorologists, or weather scientists, can keep track of several tropical storms at once without confusion. Monitoring tropical storms is important for the safety of ships that sail in tropical waters. And for people who live along tropical ocean coasts who need to be warned of approaching danger. The practice of naming hurricanes and tropical storms began in the 1950s. For a long time until 1979 only women's names were used. The World Meteorological Organization decides which names will be on the list. Creating lists for six years at a time. The names begin with all the letters of the alphabet, with the exception of Q. U, X, Y, and Z, because few names begin with these letters. Hurricanes and tropical storms are given names from the list in alphabetical order as they appear. And a name may be reused once six years have passed. But if a storm has caused very great damage, its name will be retired. Which means it cannot be reused for at least ten years. Why do I laugh when someone tickles me? The millions of tiny sensors under your skin which detect touch, pain, and temperature send information to your brain about your surroundings, and your brain tells you how to react. When someone tickles you, your touch sensors are overloaded with messages. And your brain puts your body on alert, making your muscles tense to help you escape. During tickling, you always yell stop. And try to get away. Right? It's not exactly relaxing. You laugh because it is a way for your body to release tension if you can't stop the tickler. Exercise and laughter are good tension releasers for the body, both make you feel better afterwards. What is a lie? A lie is a statement that isn't true. It is told on purpose, to make others believe something that is false. Sometimes people tell what are called white lies. Which are generally told to avoid hurting someone's feelings. If your grandma asks if you like her cookies, for example. You might say yes even though they tasted like cardboard while your motives may be pure. It's still best to tell the truth in as gentle a way as possible, or, in the cookie example. To redirect the conversation by pointing out something your grandma makes that you really do like. Most people would rather know they can count on you to give an honest answer. Then suspect that you might be saying something just to make them feel good. What kind of animal is a seahorse? These unusual and fascinating creatures offer many surprises. They are fish, though with their bony rings, horse-like heads, and curly, gripping tails, they don't look anything like other fish. 
Most seahorses are quite small, around 1.5 inches, 4 centimeters, in length. Though the largest of them can be nearly 12 inches long, 30 centimeters. Scientists believe that seahorses mate with a single partner. A behavior called monogamy that is rare in the animal world. And, even more unusual, it is the male seahorse that gets pregnant. Carrying and nurturing the fertilized eggs in a pouch in his body. The female deposits the eggs in the male's body. And he provides oxygen and nutrients until the young are ready to hatch. The seahorse population has been threatened in recent years by destruction of its habitat and by overfishing. Hundreds of thousands of seahorses are caught and sold each year to large aquariums and to people who simply like to collect unusual animals. Many more are sold to several countries in the Far East where seahorses are believed to have medicinal value. Why do birds sing? Just as people talk to each other to accomplish a number of different things. So do birds sing for a variety of reasons. Perhaps the primary reason birds sing, and squawk, call, or chirp, is to attract or communicate with a possible mate. Once a mate has been chosen, the male bird sings to announce his choice and warn other males away from his mate. If approached by a hostile male, a bird might make threatening noises to scare his opponent away without having to fight. Birds also call to other birds to alert them to a good food source, or warn them that a predator is coming. Baby birds sing to let their parents know they are hungry. And sometimes birds sing for no apparent reason, just because they can. There is an actual scientific category of birds called songbirds. It includes several thousand species nearly half of all bird types and covers larks, swallows, and most birds that people keep as pets. Not all songbirds have pretty voices, like the harsh-voiced crow, for example, and some sing very rarely. On the other hand, some birds that are not classified as songbirds have beautiful songs. A bird is classified as a songbird because it has special voice-producing organs. Not necessarily because it produces the most lovely song. <laughs>